Hi students, I hope you're having a great Thanksgiving week off. Uh, welcome to my office. <laughs> I thought it might be good to give you uh, a little help. The homework assignment I asked you to do for Monday includes a couple of problems that um, I think I could help you with by showing you an example. Uh, so if you have time to watch this video, I'm going to try and keep this pretty short, but I think it will help you uh, with the homework and therefore help you have more time to, to study for the test that's coming up. So, uh, the example I want to do is actually calculating an integral uh, using the basic material that we've already learned. And uh, so here's the example, and it's similar to one that's on the homework assignment. Um, and there's a couple of problems on the homework assignment that I think would benefit from looking at this. So I hope it will help you. Let's suppose we take the function 7x plus 2, and we use the interval from negative 2 to 3. So I've already drawn a, a rough sketch of that. It's just a straight line with a slope of 7. And let's suppose we want to calculate, first of all, if f is Riemann integrable, and if it is, the value of the integral. Okay, so one thing that we can sometimes do uh, to decide if the function is Riemann integrable is to consider a partition of this interval into segments that are equal width to one another. So there's a name for that, and it's written as p sub n. And this is a partition into n pieces that has every single subinterval of the same width. So each subinterval has width. The width of each subinterval is b minus a over n. And in this case, of course, the b minus a is 5, so this would be 5 over n. So when we're calculating our upper sums and our lower sums, we're going to be looking at rectangles, and all of them are going to have the same width, which is 5 divided by n. Okay? And basically, the terms of that uh, partition, the xi's that make up the partition, can be expressed as follows. We start at negative 2, which is the leftmost endpoint of the subinterval, and we simply start moving over to the right by various multiples of 5 over n. So x1 would be at negative 2 plus 5 over n. So that, I don't know where that is exactly, but maybe it's right here. Negative 2 plus 5 over n. x2 would be negative 2 plus two factors of 5 over n. So maybe that's right here. Negative 2 plus 2 times 5 over n. And so on. The nth term, which is the last term in this uh, partition, x sub n, you'll notice that's just negative 2 plus 5 over n times n. Negative 2 plus 5, which is 3, which is the right-hand endpoint of this, of this subinterval. So basically, this is x1, this is x2, all the way over to xn, and of course negative 2 is really x0. Okay? So that's, that is one way of creating a partition. Okay? And from that partition, we can try to calculate the upper sum of the function with respect to p sub n. Okay? Now remember that that is a sum of terms, but each of the terms consists of the delta xi's, Notice that the delta xi for each i is just 5 over n. So we're going to multiply 5 over n by the supremum value. Remember when we do the upper sum, it's the supremum of the function on the subinterval. Now you'll notice that this is a function that's increasing, monotone increasing. So the supremum value for each subinterval is actually going to occur at the right-hand edge of each subinterval. Okay, so let's do this. Let's factor out the width of each one of our rectangles. They're all going to have a width of 5 over n. And what I want to do now is add up the heights of each rectangle. Well, the height of each rectangle is really, the, is, as I said, we just evaluate the function at the appropriate value of x, which is always the right-hand edge of each subinterval. So it's just going to be f of x1, f of x2, and we add all the way up to f of xn. Okay? It's going to look something like that. And what we can do is we can, we can calculate what these are. So f of x1 would be, you know, 
7x1 plus 2, and then 7x2 plus 2 for f of x2, and so on, 7xn plus 2. So it's going to look like that. And we can do a little bit of algebra here. We have, let's see, there are, there are n of these terms, right? Sorry, n of these terms here. So I've added 2 a total of n times. So let me do that part first, 2n. And then I have 7 being multiplied by each of these xi's. So let's see, each of my xi's is each one of these things, right? So the 7 is being multiplied by, I'm just going to say the sum of the xi's for a moment, okay? Where i goes from 1 to n. All right, um, so this is 5 over n times, well, 7 times, well, x1 will be negative 2 plus 5 over n. And x2 will be negative 2 plus 2 times 5 over n, etc. 7 times negative 2 plus n times 5 over n. And then don't forget that we also have, at the very end of all of that, plus 2n, like that. Okay, so if you actually work that out, I have 5 over n, and this is actually negative 14, negative 14, and so on, negative 14 n times, and then plus 2n. So it's negative 14n plus 2n, which is negative 12n. And then as far as the, the second part, this is 35 over n. This is 35 times 2 over n, and so on. This is 35 times n over n. So it's 35 over n times the sum of the first n positive integers. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus dot, 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 plus n. Okay? I'm running out of room here. Let me come up here. So this is actually 5 over n times the quantity negative 12n plus 35 over n, and the formula for the sum of the first n positive integers, maybe you guys know it, is n times n plus 1 all over 2. And if we simplify that, we have 5 over n factored out. Up here, these n's cancel, and I have 35 over 2 times n, that's 17 and a half n, minus 12 n, so that's 5 and a half n's, and then uh, plus 35 over 2. Okay, so just make sure you check that arithmetic. And 5.5 uh, times 5 is 27.5. Notice that the n's cancel right here. And then the second part of it is, uh, well gosh, 35 times 5 is 175? Yeah, over 2 n. So there's the formula. And that's the formula for u, p, n of f. All right? So since you guys can rewind if you need to, I'm going to erase <laughs> and come back here and just write that answer down. Okay, so this turns out to be 27.5 plus 175 over 2n. Okay? On the other hand, um, the... Oh, and by the way, each one of these is an upper estimate for the actual value of the of the Riemann integral, right? We're gonna the upper Riemann integral is obtained by taking the infimum of all of these values, right? So um, the infimum of all of these values is actually 27.5 because the part that you're adding over here can become as arbitrarily small, positive small as you want. So 27.5 plus a little bit, and you take the infimum of all those values, you're going to get that, okay? Um, however, we do need to be a little bit careful because this is not every partition. This is only a very special kind of partition where all of the subintervals have an equal length. So what I really need to be um, careful with here is that, is just to point out that the infimum of all of these values Okay, the infimum of all of these upn of f's, right? Uh, sorry, the infimum of all of the upf's, not just the piece of n of f's, where p is a partition, 
right, has to be less than or equal to all of these numbers. So in particular, it has to be less than or equal to 27.5. And this then becomes your upper Riemann integral of f from a to b. Okay? Now if you do the LPN of f calculation, it's actually very similar. You have rectangles of width 5 over n, and now you're going to start at f of x naught and stop at f of x n minus 1, because now you're, uh, you're looking at the infimum value, right, on each subinterval here, which will be at the left-hand endpoint of each interval. So I'm going to be brief about this. The, what ends up happening, basically, is you get the same sort of expression. So it's going to end up being negative 12n plus 35 over n. The only difference now is that instead of adding the numbers 1 through n, here we're going to be adding the numbers 0 through n minus 1. So the expression will become n minus 1 times n over 2. In other words, that's the formula for the sum of the first n minus 1 numbers. Okay? But again, the n's cancel here. If you simplify this whole thing again, you're just going to get 5 over n times, well, again, 5.5. Okay, but this time it's going to be minus 35 over 2. Okay? 5.5n, I'm sorry. Minus 35 over 2. Okay, so again, this becomes 27.5 minus 175 over 2n. All right? And so, the, therefore, the lower, the lower Riemann integral, right, has to be, remember, it's the greatest lower bound of all of these estimates. So it must be at least as big as all of these numbers. So it has to be at least 27.5. On the other hand, this number has to be less than or equal to, remember we had a theorem, the lower Riemann integral is always less than or equal to, the upper Riemann integral. So actually what you can then do is make a nice little chain, a nice little chain of statements which says 27.5, right, has to be less than or equal to the lower Riemann integral of f, which is less than or equal to the upper Riemann integral of f, which is less than or equal to 27.5. So therefore these guys must be equal. And that means that my function is Riemann integrable, and the value is 27.5. So that is how you can, can do that problem. Okay? And you could check it, by the way, using your knowledge of integration. If you integrate this by just doing antiderivative and evaluating it from negative 2 to 3, you can confirm that this is the answer that you're going to get. Okay? Just be, in, be aware that when you calculate the upper and lower sums for these partitions, you're not doing every partition, right? You're doing a lot of partitions. You're doing one for every value of n, but you're not doing all of them. But you're doing enough of them, you see, to come up with a bunch of upper estimates for the upper Riemann integral and a bunch of estimates on the lower Riemann integral, and you know that these two numbers are kind of converging to 27.5 from above and below. So when you take infimums and supremums, you end up being able to conclude that all of these numbers, it's basically up here, all of these numbers have to be the same number, okay? The same number. Um, another thing that is, is kind of noteworthy, I'll just wrap up with one final comment here, is because this function is monotone increasing, when you compare the upper and lower sums here, Let's see, I've run out of room here, f of x, n. When you compare the upper and lower sums, they have almost all of the same terms, right? So in other words, f of x, 1 is going to cancel here and so on. This one's going to cancel here. The only thing that's going to survive, in other words, if you were to subtract these, if you were to subtract these two values, remember theorem 6.2, if you subtract these two values, most of it cancels. You have a 5 over n. The only thing other than that that you have left is f of x n minus f of x naught. 
which is actually just a constant number. f of x n is just f of 3, and f of x naught is just f of negative 2. So this will be a constant, and 5 is a constant. So the point is, you can choose n to be large enough to make this expression less than epsilon if you wanted to do that. So remember with theorem 6.2, theorem 6.2 says that a function is Riemann integrable if every epsilon greater than zero has some partition, okay, such that UPF minus LPF is less than epsilon. Well, what this shows in this example is, yeah, that is true because you can just simply use the piece of n partition for n sufficiently large to make this expression, which is just a constant over n, less than epsilon. What theorem 6.2 doesn't tell you, however, is what the value of the Riemann integral is. So I can tell you that this function is Riemann integrable simply from this simple calculation here. But if I ask you what is the value of the Riemann integral, that's where this work with upper and lower Riemann sums and realizing that they're the same value equal to 27.5, that's where we need that part. Because theorem 6.2 doesn't actually tell you what the value of the Riemann integral is, the definite integral on some interval. So uh, you have to have that as well. So there's a problem on the homework where uh, I think I asked you to work with e to the x. That's a monotone increasing function, so you, you might be able to take advantage of this comparison of UPF and LPF. There will be a lot of common terms. Um, and then there's another problem on the homework where I think I ask you to work with this piece of n partition specifically and do something kind of similar to what I showed you here. I hope this is helpful, just trying to make the homework a little bit uh, easier and give you a jump start on understanding this section because when we come back from the break um, we're going to have to get ready for our midterm rather quickly and I didn't want you to be fumbling around trying to understand all the basics here uh, when you can watch it and then um, ask me questions. If anything I said during this presentation wasn't clear, uh, you certainly can email me. I'll be ac accessing my email daily over the break and I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Okay, so uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys soon. Bye.